Well, good morning. Happy Easter to you all. And First Everman, it is good to gather with you, even though it's in this way. Uh, we trust that our not being together actually is producing a longing and a groaning for us to be with one another. Lord willing, that will be sooner than later. And as we do so, we are reminded just the joy that it is to gather together, even on the days that we're not able to, because we're reminded of just that great desire not to forsake the assembly of the saints and to actually be together to worship our Lord and Savior. So I do hope that there is some encouragement that we all can find as we celebrate today, which is Easter Sunday in 2020. And so just as you so often know, to say that the Lord is risen, He is risen, He is risen indeed. Let me read to you a opening passage of scripture out of Hebrews. It's one of my favorite benedictions that we have in the scriptures. And so Hebrews chapter 13 in verses 20 and 21, here's what it says. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all the saints say, Amen. Now, a little bit unusual this morning. I do want us to actually sing a song together. We're just going to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I just hope that, um, I mean, it's not produced. It's just simply a time for us to gather and lift our voices. And, you know, look, if you've ever wanted to... Uh, you know, dance or sing like no one is watching, this is the time, okay? So uh, may the Lord just be lifted up as we sing our songs together, even though it's not where we can actually hear one another as we lift our voices. This is 
us all of our hope and our plea. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus nothing but the blood of Jesus nothing but the blood of Jesus Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and turn in those Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. So we have been in a series over the last many weeks um, that simply called The Church That Walks by Faith. And there were three aspects of that that we unpacked a little bit out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And what we have is in 2 Corinthians 5, we have our understanding that the church that walks by faith actually understands that they have a different perspective and that perspective is an eternal one it's not a temporary one and also we have by that perspective that we understand that we have a particular purpose because we are eternal we understand that our purpose then our passion is to please Christ above all else and above all others now that leads into the third thing which is as we have our passion and our purpose, we actually have that purpose lived out in our proclamation, particularly through our motivation of wanting to see him glorified, to see him lifted up, but also that we're going to give an accountability before the Lord for what we do and the good works that we do while on this earth. But again, not unto salvation for those who are truly born again. Those who are not born again could not by any merit, any good set of works ever accomplish heaven. That is only done by the work of Christ, which we have celebrated this week in Passion Week. So we're actually going to go back a little bit into the previous letter that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's a long chapter, and but I hope it's a blessing for you on this Easter Sunday here on April 11th of 2020, and that it might be just glorifying to the Lord. It might be edifying to you, and I pray that it would bless your home. I pray that it will bless you personally. I pray also that it will just bless others around you because truly the resurrection changes everything. You know, that's probably the most, I would guess, it's probably one of the most popular titles for an Easter message that the resurrection changes everything. But the fact is it does. It truly does. You know, we all have had different events in our lives that, you know, might have changed the course forever. Um, You know, prior to my resignation from my last church in 2014, which was very difficult. I without a doubt believe it was what the Lord wanted and it was a blessing, I believe, ultimately to the body, even though there was no discord or disruption in that sense. Simply, I believed in order to preserve what the Lord had done, that it was best for me to resign simply, but also it was to allow us the opportunity to care for some family that had been really hurting and and I just, I, I, I had no idea the course that would set us on. It, it changed us. But even then, it still changes us and changes our course for just a little while. Before that, we had had, 2010 was by far the most difficult year that we, at least as a family, had ever faced. Um, at, at least by cumulative effect. We, many years prior, had experienced, had experienced miscarriages, which are extremely painful But in 2010, within about a 24-hour period, we'd had a major car wreck while we were still in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And it was, uh, yeah, it was awful. It was a head-on collision. It was not our fault. Um, There were deaths, not by by God's just mercy in our family, in our car. There were none. 
but there was some serious injury that had some lasting effects for me and also um, it changed some other people's lives and some in a sense for eternity just less than 24 hours later we got news that my father had had a stroke and uh, a major stroke and that certainly has changed the course of his life forever we have these events that occur but you know honestly and not diminishing the significance of those events it still falls short of how the resurrection changes our course forever because it doesn't just change our course for five years or 10 years or even our professional careers that might run 30 or 40 or even 50 years. It actually changes the course of our eternity, which impacts very much what we do during those five and 10, 30 and 50 year chunks. And so I hope and pray that you will grasp that from this passage today in 1 Corinthians 15 as we look at it. So again, let me just remind you that just because we're saying this about the resurrection changing everything, if we really mean everything, that means even the temporal things. It means even the things right here. It means even your relationships right now. So just keep that in mind that there is not a relationship, there is not a single thing that you share in or participate in or a part of that should not be impacted by the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, uh, first of all, let me give you just a little bit of background on Corinthians. So I've told you a little bit of this in our in our previous um, in our previous series, and simply this that in First Corinthians, basically in both letters, Paul is dealing with the issue of unity. In First Corinthians, because they had really been lax in their um, understanding of doctrine and faithful practice. In fact, they'd even been confusing what Christian love looked like by tolerating sinners in their midst and. This is not to say some harsh or quick judgment, simply those who were unrepentant were being accepted still, and yet Scripture is clear that for those who are not repentant of public sin, known sin, when confronted by those in leadership, that if they refuse, then they have to be dismissed from the body, not as a punishment, as much as just a warning to them that if they persist in unrepentant sin, it actually could be giving evidence that they're not truly a Christian, even though they may think themselves so. And again, that's not our call. We're just simply called to do what God has said for us to do as a faithful church. And it's also a warning to others that might be dabbling in sin in the church that it's not public yet to, to remember that sin is serious because Satan's one of Satan's greatest tools is to show us how not that serious sin is. Well, Passion Week, Holy Week, the crucifixion of Christ is a stark reminder of the seriousness of sin. And the resurrection of Christ is a stark reminder of the only lasting victory over sin and ultimately over the greatest enemy that Satan had at his disposal, which would be death. But this is something God and God alone wields. Over in 1 Corinthians 16, 24, it says, May love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Paul had a great affection for these really messed up people. Um, in fact, even at the very beginning of the letter, he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. I mean, he thought of them all the time. He wanted, to, um, he wanted them to know of his affection. He wanted them to know of his great purpose, which was his love is expressed more than anything in sharing the testimony of Christ that was actually confirmed in them. Okay? It was confirmed in them. They had the gifts. The Holy Spirit had fallen upon them at the revealing of Jesus Christ to them and was going to sustain them to the end. And they would be guiltless until the day of the Lord. I mean, Paul is affirming all this at the very beginning of the letter. But he had a great concern about their unity. And he had a concern about their unity, again, because there were, there were divisions, in large part because of theological error, which always produces some kind of division. Also, that sinful tolerance I was telling you about, including sexual sin. You know, he deals with these issues. He tackles them. He, he tackles them head on. But he also has them rally around grace through faith alone in Christ alone. He doesn't focus on um, a, a particular tribe or position or kind of pet, secondary or tertiary belief. He focuses on the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul believed that a right understanding of the gospel would actually bring them unity and, would, and really, in a sense, right the ship of the Corinthian church. 
and he really believed that a circumspect understanding and view of his of Christ's life, Daryl, uh, Daryl, sorry, life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension was e- essential for the church to understand that they have been saved, and they've been saved by grace, and they've been saved for God, and they are all in the same boat together. But it does. It requires a right understanding to produce right shared beliefs and right shared practices in the local church. So no doubt that this passage is primarily for, I believe, those who are redeemed in the church. So First Everman members who are genuinely born again, I believe this is for you and other true believers who may be joining us. Uh, And the reason I say true believers, because there are many who may think themselves to be believers because they've gone to church here and there, or because they're not murderers um, or other, you know, types of criminals, comparatively so to others. You know, let me just remind you that whether it was a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or a thief on the cross who had committed murder, okay, Christ is able to save but you must believe that Christ died for your sin and you must believe that Christ actually did die and was buried and actually is giving you his righteousness because yours isn't good enough. None of it, no matter what you bring to the table. But you also have to believe in the resurrection, that it was physical, it was visible, it was real. And so I want to encourage you to call upon the name of the Lord even now, even during this message. So, First of all, I want you to understand the the resurrection changes, yes, everything. But I want us to, I want us to understand that it changes our understanding of the gospel. Okay, we're going to read verses one through eleven to begin with. Okay, again, this is over in First Corinthians fifteen. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. It's a great passage. It's a great phrase. And it's a truth. According to the Scriptures, always been God's plan. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I am per- I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, it's both saved and an apostle. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So, I mean, Paul is saying, you know, in this line, just tracing all that had occurred at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and how he appeared to many after having died for the sins of, of all, that he says, you know, as, as one untimely born, because if you remember the story, Christ appeared after even the ascension to Paul while he was on the road to Damascus. And in that appearance, had called him to be an apostle and had given him the gospel. And a post-resurrection experience of explaining the grace of God as the scriptures have always intended it, as Paul understood, as you heard him twice say, according to the scriptures, he said, so we preach. See, every religion has a gospel. Every single religion has a gospel. And the truth is, whether people have it formalized or not, every single individual and every group of people, so to speak, have a religion. They really do. There is always something that we worship. There is always something that we go after. And we have to understand that there is also a gospel. There's always a good news of that religion that we follow that we want to convince people of, we want to share with others about. We want to cause them to have as much joy as we have in a particular issue. Now, for us, we believe that our gospel, that true Christians, those who believe that Christ alone saves, okay, that it's not any participation of our own except to have faith. And so by his grace, through that faith, we turn from sin because the Spirit of God gives us the power to do so. And we turn in faith to follow Christ, believing he was risen from the dead, believing he is preparing a place for us. We will follow him all of our days. Christianity actually is unique from all other religions in this way. Every other religion, okay, every other religion 
has someone who was a main leader and none of them have a main leader who was raised from the dead. Also, Christianity is the only religion that has, at its core, you may be right with this deity, with what we believe to be Jehovah God, what we believe to be the God of the Bible, only by understanding that it's already been accomplished for you by a Savior. Okay, Every other religion says in order to get to God, you have to be good. And if you're not good enough, then you're going to go somewhere in between or some other place, and you better hope that other people are praying to get you in there or praying and hoping that you get in there. It is not faith alone in Christ alone for what he's done. Again, I've said this so many times that certainly true believers, true Christians, show works. They show works of faith, without a doubt. However, only Christianity says that actual conversion, actual salvation occurs by understanding that Christ alone has completed all of the work necessary for us to be okay with God. And we trust that he, done, that he did so and has done so on our behalf already. It's finished. That's our good news. That's the absolute good news of, the Christi of Christianity. And so when Christ rose from the dead, it became the good news that we go after. It became the good news that we live out. The resurrection changed and forever changes our understanding of the gospel. You cannot believe in the gospel without believing in the resurrection. It is biblically impossible. Okay, And sharing the gospel will be emboldened by the fact that Christ is alive. That is our good news. See, the resurrection also reminds us that you know, not only does it change our perspective of the gospel because Christ has risen from the dead and it changes then what we preach, but it gives us security because Christ is alive. He forever secures our salvation. You know, the Bible says that Christ is at the right hand of the Father even now, interceding on our behalf. I mean, in a sense, our belief in eternal security isn't because, it's certainly not because we pray to prayer. It is certainly not because we raised a hand or walked an aisle. The reason that those who are born again are kept saved forever is because Christ lives. It is not good news if it's just simply going to be a moralistic lifestyle. Because Christ lives and because he is alive, then we are saved forever. If there was some way that Christ could die, then we would cease to be saved. But that, of course, is a divine impossibility. And it gives us boldness. It gives us boldness because he is alive. He has conquered the worst that man could offer. Because Jesus Christ is alive, it emboldens us. And that's what Paul says. He says, because of all this, because Christ is alive, so we preach. That is the core of the boldness. That is at the heart of it. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. It's a living Christ that spoke the word to Paul and gave him the charge. And Paul says, so I preach. Look, it doesn't mean all of you will be called to be preachers, but you do all, in a sense, preach with your lifestyle and your words. You proclaim the gospel, the good news of what you treasure and value the most. And I pray that it is indeed the gospel of Christ as revealed in the scriptures. So the resurrection changes our understanding of the gospel. The resurrection also changes our understanding of death. I mean, I know this seems like a no-brainer, um, but that's okay. We need to be reminded of no-brainers. And so um, let me read this passage, and this is a, a long section, but it starts in verse 12 of, again, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay, meaning that other people, when they die, you know, this question is being raised that what happens to people when they die, um, there's false teachers that are causing disruption and therefore really um, distress and even depression among people in what they are claiming happens to people when they die. But here's Paul's argument. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. Do you, do you hear that? I mean, he's reiterating the fact that the resurrection changes our understanding of the gospel because without the resurrection, there is no gospel, there is no faith, there are no Christians. 
we are even found to be misrepresenting God because he testified, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We would actually be the fools that the world would claim that we are for believing the things that we do. And yet, the resurrection is true. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. I love that, but in fact. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every, every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. He's speaking of the submission to the will of the Father by the Son when he was here to drink that cup, but then be raised. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Now, we'll talk about that in just a second. It's, it's a curious statement. If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. I mean, you know, it, it, it crescendos to a pretty harsh rebuke. But what Paul is essentially saying is, you have lost sight of the veracity of the resurrection. Okay, and they are doubting the resurrection of the dead. So basically, you understand what this what this does. It changes your perception of death and your understanding of death. Basically, if there's no afterlife, you will live however the heck or even hell that you want because there's no accounting for anything in this life. And that includes faith or belief alone in God to save. That would radically change your understanding of living if your understanding of dying had no understanding or embracing of the resurrection. And he goes on to say, look, you need to wake up. And, and it seems to me from the context, he is saying that what will wake them up from their stupor is a, rem a reminder that Jesus Christ indeed is alive. Remember, I mean, guys, this isn't that long after the resurrection. Now, I didn't do the math, but a couple of decades maybe. It's not that long after the resurrection. I mean, how, how far are we removed? We go through the same rote processes in the spring of every year. This year, God has seen fit. I'm certainly not saying this is the only reason, but it is, I think, a reason. God has seen fit to disrupt our normal rhythms when it comes to Easter. And in doing so, I hope that it, in a sense, kind of coalesces or brings everything or synthesizes everything down to its most common reason why we celebrate this week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've all been touched by death. We've had some even in our church body that have had fear of death this week. There have been pain. There have been those that have been hurting. You know, it is especially hard when we see children die. It is gut-wrenching. It is grueling. Death changes us. And despite what many may think and many may believe about all living things, the fact is humanity is different. 
we do have souls. We do have a spiritual trajectory, so to speak. So if Christ is not raised, then Christ, then Christians, there's really no point to us. But Christ has been raised. He has been raised. Now, one thing I do want to mention because the text mentions it is Paul says, you know, if there is no resurrection, why do we why do we baptize people on behalf of the dead? Look, there is nowhere else in Scripture that speaks of the baptism on behalf of the dead. Basically, post mortem, that people in life would be baptized to somehow bring about the sanctification or even justification of those who had already died. That is nowhere else in Scripture. Look, that's a that is a a core central hermeneutic to faithful evangelical Christians, which is this. Our core hermeneutic, which is the interpretation of Scripture, is that Scripture interprets Scripture. So I really think what's going on here is, is that he is exposing their own, the irony of the argument by some that there is no resurrection of the dead because they were actually, part of the false teaching was a false practice of baptism on behalf of those who had died. Okay, they made this a mystical, spiritual thing, and yet on one hand, they're saying there's no real resurrection from the dead. On the other hand, they're actually baptizing on behalf of the dead as if there is actually an afterlife or a destination for those who have died. I think that's, I think in context that makes a lot of sense. That would be very consistent with types of arguments that Paul has made in the past. Um, Acts 17 uh, at the Oropagus, I, th- I think that he very much has used that as part of his apologetic um, and also his evangelistic approach. So I really feel like that's where he's at. And so I think that what he's simply saying is that, you know, figuratively as he's speaking about this false practice they're doing, he's actually saying, look, this is this is still running inside of you. You still kind of are suspicious. You still suspect that there is something else. There's something more after we die. Resurrection of the dead. We will wind up someplace and it's going to be determined by what we did with Christ, what we did with righteousness. Did we try to achieve that righteousness ourselves? If so, we are damned to hell. If we by faith said, Christ, you alone are my righteousness. You died in my place, which I deserved, and you were raised from the dead, and I turn from my sin, and I follow you, then if that is truly the heartbeat, if that truly is your passion and your intent, then you end up finding that you indeed are born again. The resurrection changes our understanding of the gospel and it emboldens our gospel. Okay, so we preach because he's alive, but it also changes our view of death, which, you know, kind of leads into a a clear understanding and which he's already touched on here. It changes our view of the afterlife. How you treat death changes how you live presently, but it also changes your view of the afterlife. If there really is a resurrection of the dead, then we have to understand that, okay, we could see this as an unnecessary Uh, question, but it is something that he deals with in this passage. So we're going to read it. So if you go on to verse 35, he says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel. He's just saying that our physical bodies now, they're, they're looking for some hint of what does it look like then? What do our spiritual bodies look like then? For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. So again, for those who are born again, when we die and then we see him, the resurrection tells us that our bodies will be glorified. If you remember on the road to Emmaus, when Christ appeared to the disciples in Luke 24, they did not recognize him. Yes, there was a sovereign kind of blinding over their eyes, but at the same time, he appeared differently. His body was not yet fully glorified, but he was changing. He was different. In verse 42, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. He's juxtaposing all these differences between the earthly body and the heavenly body of those who are born again and the resurrection bodies that we'll have. Thus it is written, the first Adam came, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. 
But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. Okay, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Okay, so as he's juxtaposing our earthly bodies and, and our future heavenly bodies, he's also juxtaposing the, um, the first Adam, who was Adam, and the second Adam, who was Christ. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So the resurrection changes everything. It changes our understanding of the gospel. It changes our understanding of death itself and therefore how we live until we die. And it changes our understanding of the afterlife. Okay, it changes that. We are in Christ. If you are in Christ in this world, you will be in Christ in the other world in heaven. You can trust that. Why? Because Christ is alive. Because Christ is alive, all those whom he has saved are saved forever. And you have the guarantee that upon your death, that you will be raised to new life. Okay? I believe we will have immediately a spiritual consciousness, even a spiritual form. But when Christ returns a second time and we are given all of our new bodies, I mean, it's it'll be recognizable and yet it's going to be something altogether different. Now look, I have no desire to promote fear because of the coronavirus, but you know, we see the ticker continuing to go up when it comes to the number of deaths related to uh, COVID-19. We see that over and over again every single day. Even if they say it's slowing down, there's still technically thousands that are dying a day. So it is imperative that we have a robust understanding of even the afterlife, that we as Christians, look, I get it. We can, we can fear how it happens, and, and we still should overcome that, and we certainly shouldn't be cavalier. I certainly think we should still be careful because we have the dignity of life and creation, and only God has governed the, the days of men and established them according to Psalm 139. So we still need to be careful and protect those who are at high risk. And therefore, we shouldn't take unnecessary risks, in my opinion. However, we should not fear death. As believers, we should not fear death because we have the hope of the resurrection. So, as we go through this, look, this is what emboldens missionaries. Because, yes, I mean, they go and they live in very dangerous places. And many have lost their lives. And God has seen fit that the gospel would go forth further through a stream of blood from martyrs. And we applaud them. And too often we applaud them with somewhere in the back of my mind, better you than me. Look, the fact is, is that we should be as emboldened as missionaries. We are all called to do so. And I'm not saying that we'll be in a situation where we have to die for our faith, but what if we were? We should not fear because the resurrection gives us hope and assurance I think part of that too is that he Paul uses this part of the this section of this um, sermon, so to speak, of his letter on the resurrection to say, "Stop sinning." Look, I know we're not going to be perfect, but he does say to stop sinning if we know that we are going to be with Christ forever, and if we persist in a particular sin without repentance. Now, if that's ongoing, it could prove that we're not believers at all. But I believe that there are some who are truly believers that are just riddled with guilt and stuck in bad habits of sin, and they, they want to be out. Look, maybe you've tried everything. Maybe you've tried all kinds of accountability or all kinds of uh, classes or uh, uh, you know addiction recovery type meetings. Look, you need to remind yourself of the gospel. You need to remind yourself of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And you need to remind yourself that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. You may, be not, you may not be perfect in this life, but you need to remember, remember this. It is absolutely of Satan for you to feel like it's impossible for you to overcome a particular sin. Jesus Christ has already overcome it on your behalf before a holy God. And then he overcame its result, which is death, by being raised from the dead. And Christ is in you the hope of glory. Of course, you can break the patterns of sin. 
because of the power of the resurrection that lives in you. Well, and the last thing I want to mention is that the resurrection changes our understanding of life right now. I know that's intuitive to death. Therefore, if we have a different view of death, then it changes how we see life. Okay, again, if you don't think there's any afterlife, you'll live however. Um, just do all you can. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. But we believe that we are going to be raised from the dead. We do believe that there is a destination. And the resurrection changes our understanding of that destination, that we do believe there is an afterlife, and it is a fellowship with him if indeed we're in Christ. And if we're not in Christ, there is a fellowship with sinners and Satan and demons in a very real place called hell, in torment and judgment that is also eternal. But lastly, just as a final charge of just three verses, in 56 through 58. Actually, let me go back to verse 50. Sorry. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable, this perishable body must not must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We positionally have victory now. And we can even, as I just mentioned, can have victory now over our sin because of the resurrection. Think about how practical this is. The resurrection changes everything. and It certainly changes our future. It certainly changes our view of death. It certainly changes our gospel that we preach. But that includes our lifestyle. It includes our lives now. If you really deeply believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, is alive today, has conquered sin, then it's going to rule over you and you're not going to allow some lie or deception to rule over you. I am a sinner too. I have struggled with habits and tendencies of sin. And I have to remember and remind myself, in a sense, preach to myself, the gospel and the gospel of the resurrection to, rem to be reminded that yes, it can be conquered and yes, I am forgiven. And even though I must still practice repentance, I am able to do so because Christ has already been victorious on my behalf and has been raised from the dead. I can live the gospel. I can share the gospel. I can have confidence in the gospel and I do not have to have fear. It will provoke in me thanksgiving, which it does for Paul. It will give me understanding of in a sense, death and the law, basically that the law actually brings definition to sin, which we were already doing even before the law came in, in human history. The law brings definition to it, and that's why it brings death. Why? Because the law says that if you sin in order to be forgiven, something must die. The law brings definition and therefore brings death to our understanding of sin. And when I'm living daily and when I'm understanding that even as a Christian, when I sin, it's not as if I'm unsaved or unsaved in the moment but I, or, uh, or can lose it, but I am doing something that's unsaved-like. And the resurrection reminds me of the power that sin had. It reminds me of the seriousness that sin entails. Because the resurrection was preceded by a horrific death. So yes, I rejoice that I am forgiven. I rejoice that it has been covered. But I do need to be reminded for the sake of faithful repentance of the seriousness of sin and the power of God necessary to have overcome that on my behalf. And then yes, it should produce thanksgiving. It should produce thanksgiving. It produces exactly what Paul says to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, there's that kind of that phrase, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I mean, I, you know, there's a, 
I love World War II movies. In fact, just last night watched Midway. Um, I, the sacrifice that men uh, and and women now, but men especially in the in the past in our military have given to preserve our freedoms and uh, e even the the strategy behind moves that were made and oftentimes those strategies uh, like Churchill for instance the the strategies that um, that he had to make before we were involved in the war that involved the knowing sacrifice of thousands of soldiers in order to buy time for more soldiers to either escape or to regroup those sacrifices are incredible the steadfastness is incredible but guys what we are doing is of even still a higher call it's still a higher cause we can be immovable we can be unstoppable with the gospel because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ we can be steady and firm we can be increasing in our work Part of sanctification is not just sinning less, but also is doing more and more faithful works. Witnessing more, serving people more, showing greater hospitality. Yes, even training ourselves and being trained at the church to understand better how to share the gospel. It's not in vain. It's not fruitless. Why? Because the resurrection just doesn't matter only to us. It matters also to those whom we are serving, whom we are telling. He is risen. Let our indeed mean that we want to be immovable. We want to be steadfast. So when we hear He is risen, indeed. So indeed, let us be immovable. Indeed, let us be steadfast. Indeed, let us increase in good works and in gospel sharing because He is alive. I can face tomorrow. I can live today. This is for your good. So I simply ask this, in light, of the ref, in light of the resurrection, and in thinking about the resurrection and how it changes everything, it changes our understanding of the gospel, changes our understanding of death, changes our understanding of the afterlife, and even changes our understanding of what it means to live life right now. What needs to change for you? What needs to change for you? Realizing that you're responding to the greatest transformation that's ever occurred. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, you have the power of Christ. You have the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead living in you. So yes, that sin can be conquered. Your fear of sharing the gospel can be done away with. Your hesitation to trust Him, not necessarily to heal every time you get sick, but even ultimately one day He will bring healing. So at some point... A sickness or something doesn't get healed. Trusting that that removes fear. What needs to change for, for you today in your perspective in light of what you now see again afresh out of 1 Corinthians 15 as the resurrection changes everything? What needs to change? And I would encourage you just to keep it into that one focused thought. What needs to change for me in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is risen? So what is going to be your indeed? Indeed, I will forsake this sin. Indeed, I will confess to my brother how I've sinned against him. Indeed, I will live steadfast. I will be immovable. I'm going to be sound in doctrine. Indeed, I'm going to be forgiving. Indeed, I'm going to actually share my faith with my neighbor. Indeed, I can actually make phone calls. I can actually still be within six feet of someone and still project a voice that proclaims the truth that Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. May God richly bless you with this knowledge and this truth, and I pray that it will transform you, knowing that Christ himself is alive today, interceding on your behalf having already prayed for you, desiring for you to be that steadfast, immovable, faithful follower. I mean, it's more than a cheering section. You are empowered by the risen Christ. May God bless you and keep you. Happy Easter.